So, thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm. This class, don't blow that disc. So, one of the things that we've seen when it comes to the spine is that we're seeing more and more and more degeneration and more deterioration than we've ever seen before. Disc problems are so prevalent that they estimate that if we just went around and started doing MRIs of everybody, at least 80% of our population is going to have some level of disc degeneration, even though they may not have any symptoms yet. The reason is because we're moving less, not because we're moving more. So what we used to see was a very rare condition was a disc herniation or a disc injury. Now the numbers are going through the roof. And our answers are typically drugs and surgery. So we're going to talk about some of these things tonight, ways that we can prevent this problem and help it to heal once it starts. So those other options don't need to be as necessary as we may have thought of before. Okay? So but I want, in order to understand how that all works, I want to take you through a little bit of an education on how discs work and what discs are, what their purpose is, a little anatomy of it so you can understand how to help it and fix it later. So what is a disc? How does it work? How did the see? I'm right on, right on point. So what we're looking at here, if everybody can see, this is a vertebrae here on the bottom. This is a disc. A disc has a center, which they call a nucleus, much like we do, we call the center of a cell the nucleus, right? And then it has layers and layers and layers and layers of very thick, very powerful, very strong ligamentous type tissue. Discs are very powerful pieces of material in our body, yet they're such an issue that almost everybody's heard of somebody who's blown a disc, right? Or herniated a disc or had a problem with it. So these are very specialized materials. They allow us two major important things. They protect us from gravity when you jump up and down and put pressure on things. And at the same time, they allow us to be able to move. We have to be able to bend, flex, and move, yes? yes. That's important. Mm -hmm. And if the spine was a solid piece of tube of bone, much like the skull protects the brain, we wouldn't be able to do that very well at all. So movement becomes such an important part of our design that we can't just protect that spinal cord and nervous system with a solid piece of bone, we have to have something to move, and we have those discs to do that for us. So they protect us against gravity, compression, we can jump up and down and do things, and they take and absorb that energy without hurting the bones, but allow us movement. So we can see from a bending and a flexing that the disc can allow us that type of movement in any direction, twisting and turning. One of the key things, I want you to look at this picture. Can you see this red line here? and here, and see the little red lines going in? Discs have a very limited blood supply. But like every other tissue, they need blood. They need nutrients to go in, and they need to get waste out. What we've learned is, is that the disc material inside has to have a constant circulation of blood flow, but there's so much pressure on a disc that it cannot get blood flow from a normal heart beat. The only way the blood is, gets enough force to get into the disc is with movement. So if we don't move, all the time we spend not moving, standing, sitting, in, up, fighting against gravity, all those moments, there's not very much blood getting into those discs. And what do we do now more than ever before? We sit. sit. We sit at computers, we sit at our desks, we sit doing whatever we do. Television and kids on computers, on phones, not outside playing, running. So they're not even developing strong, healthy bones and discs to start out with because we're not getting the same activity. It's not uncommon to see 90-year-olds in my neighborhood walking around and kids in the house playing video games. Those kids, if they don't get out and walk around, aren't going to make it to 90. 
I promise. So, what is a blown disc? Well, if a disc becomes damaged, there's different names and different terminologies. If it's just a little bit of a weakened bulge because a couple of layers have broken through on that ligamentous tissue, it'll start to protrude, so they call it a protrusion. If it actually herniates, the new words that they're using now is an extrusion, meaning it's broken through all the layers. And if it kind of, if you will, explodes, <laughs> then we have what's called sequestration and that means it's in different pieces all inside your spinal canal. There's not a lot of white blood cells in these areas around it so if you do damage a disc it heals very very slowly. Not a lot of blood supply, not a lot of white blood cells to go in there and gobble up all that material and tissue mm -hmm. so it doesn't heal like a cut and that kind of speed, it can take years for a disc to recover. And that's if you don't keep re-irritating and re-aggravating it along the way. And you do everything right. Some of the symptoms we see with disc issues, they're usually very vague unless they're pressuring directly onto the nerve root. So for the neck, you might have neck pain that just goes into the shoulder blade area. Be tense, achy, could be sharp, could be you turn and move certain directions and it intensifies it. Very much the same as a subluxation and a pinched nerve. Very, very similar. The difference is, is that if it actually hits the nerve, then it becomes a more direct pattern to wherever that nerve goes to. So if that bulge hits the nerve itself, it might run down to my fingertips or it might give me headaches or it might shoot down my leg to my foot if it's coming from my low back. But only when it actually hits the nerve do we get that symptom. We can have herniated discs because they don't hit any of the nerves and not have any symptoms. So we can have patients who, for example, may come in with an MRI that might show you a herniated disc that might feel fine. But unless that disc material touches that nerve and sets off a whole cascade of pain, they may not even know they have it. So what we used to think was you had an injury, you lifted something heavy, you hurt yourself. And now what we're understanding now is, is that there are very less common severe traumas that cause disc injuries. Far more common are the very subtle, slow, breaking down over long periods of time issues. Subluxation degeneration is the major cause of disc injuries. Subluxation, as you know from being patients here, is the bone out of its normal position, making that joint not move properly with every movement that you make. And over time, just like the tires wear out on your car with no symptoms, <laughs> mm -hmm. eventually something's got to blow if it's out of alignment keep it in alignment and it lasts a really long time. And you can see degenerative discs at a level where there's a subluxation and a perfectly healthy disc one level above or one level below. So to say that it's normal aging is completely false. There has to be a cause. Because it's so common, it's very common for doctors to say things like well, you have some arthritis, but it's normal for your age. That's a huge mistake. Because right next to that normally aged arthritic joint is a perfectly healthy one that's not aging the same, and only one of them technically could be normal and aging at the same pace. The healthy one is aging normally. The unhealthy one is unhealthy, and there has to be a reason. And the subluxation in the bone out of place makes the most sense as to why that's happening. It can be from traumas, but most of what we see nowadays is microtraumas. So somebody who's in a normal position, standing position, if they have what we could call maybe say 100% pressure on their disc, do you have any idea what might cause the most pressure on a disc? Anybody want to guess? It's not okay. <laughs> Anybody other than Dr. Ralph want to answer? 
sitting. What might be more than standing? What what, what sitting. What, sitting. Sitting causes more pressure on the disc than standing. Oh, that's right. Yes. Okay. Do you know what causes understanding that sitting has more pressure than, on the disc than standing? Can you idea what might make it even worse? Poor posture while you're sitting. So you can take 100% pressure standing, 150% pressure to 170% pressure when you're sitting, to over 200% pressure, twice as much pressure, 220% by a lot of studies, by sitting in poor posture at a desk while you're at your computer. Two to two and a quarter more pressure, times more pressure than when you're standing on your discs. And because you're not moving while it's under that pressure that entire time, it's not getting blood flow, it's not getting nutrients, and it can't repair itself or heal itself in any way or regenerate. Think of how many hours the average person sitting. I mean, many people are sitting all day, they sitting at their desks, they come home because they're mentally tired from working on their computers, not physically, but just mentally wore out from their day. All they want to do is sit and relax. They sit and relax on their couch, watch television, probably still in poor posture, I would guess, for the majority of us. And then if we don't fall asleep on the couch in some poorer posture than we were even in before, we go to bed and then also don't move, but at least we've taken gravity off our spine and off of the disc by quite a bit by laying flat. If we're not all twisted and turned while we're sleeping and screwing it up somewhere. Right? Right. So, we get up the next day to work out. No? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Some, 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 yes. some of us? <laughs> Maybe. But the majority of the public's not doing that. They're tired, they're hitting their energy drink, their cups of coffee, heading off to work to go sit some more. And so, typically sitting in their car in traffic somewhere to get to work to sit some more. So without the movement, the body deteriorates. We do a class, sitting is the new smoking, and when I talk about that is the years have gone by that I keep teaching that class, what I'm realizing is, is that it's actually worse than smoking ever was. The damage that's being done to our cells on a cellular level, the lack of blood flow through our bodies is actually being related to more sickness, heart disease, diabetes, etc., than ever before. Than worse than smoking ever did. Because a lot of us in the years gone past were smoking, but we were on a smoke break from doing physical activity. Now we may be taking a smoke break, might be the only time we get up and walk during the day. Right? Yeah. So causes. So we can have a perfectly normal disc, a slightly degenerated disc, a bulging disc, herniated disc like a balloon in there and that nerve. Over time, because there's no blood so supply and very slow healing, it starts to degenerate, collapse, and deteriorate. Eventually the bones will start to change how they function and the body will start to almost fuse itself together by growing bone onto the bone, not allowing it to ever move again. What do we do? Let's go over what not to do. So typically when we talk about how to protect your back, there's certain movements that are hard on the back. I've already talked about posture, right? So it's really important to get up and move around throughout the day as much as you can. You don't want to lift um, you know, with your back. Your legs are designed to, to be much stronger. There's much more muscle tissue around your legs and around your hips. If you've ever seen a young child my son's 20 months, when he goes to pick something up, he goes like this mm -hmm. to pick it up, he squats. He doesn't bend like this to pick up anything. Somewhere along the way we get a little bit lazy and the body realizes that it's much less muscle tissue to do this and a lot more energy to do this because you have to activate all those muscles. And we become a little bit lazy and we start doing things the wrong way and create bad habits. Lifting with your legs and your hips the stronger muscles is what we're designed to do. When you think of it, next time you bend, just squat. If your knees are good enough to be able to do that. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. So, don't bend and twist. So bending, twisting, puts a tremendous amount of pressure onto the disc. If you even got a little bit of a disc bulge, it'll actually, you can actually see it push out on different tests and research that's being done. A lot of pressure on it. Um, 
don't sit all day without breaks. Some of the studies are saying that we should 10 minutes out of every hour be up and moving that we're sitting. That's the healthiest. So those studies are being done, again, that's more the sitting is the smoking, new smoking class, but those studies are being done in major corporations and what they'll show you is, is that if somebody works for 45 to 50 minutes, gets up and moves for 10 or 15 minutes, that they get so much more work done than the person who stays at their desk for that entire time because their brain is actually functioning better, they're getting better blood flow throughout their body, they're functioning at a much higher performance rate, getting so much more work done during the 45 minutes than somebody who's been sitting for three or four hours and on their fifth hour and their seventh hour and their eighth hour and getting almost nothing done because they're just not getting the, the nutrients to the brain. All these things, don't stretch, bending forward. We always recommend if you're going to do stretches, hamstring stretches, things like that, your back stays flat. You don't curve the back because that's going to push those discs and put pressure on them to go towards the nerve. Want that curve in the back, keep the back flat to stretch the hamstrings. You still engage the same hamstring muscle you're trying to loosen. Much healthier for it. And of course, I have to put a little ore in here. You have to get checked by the chiropractor because these things are asymptomatic. Asymptomatic. There's no symptoms in 80% of the people. They don't find out they have one until they sneeze, until they go to pick up a stick in the backyard one day and they're stuck or something happens that they're stuck on the floor and they can't get up. And everybody, yes, if you've heard of somebody that that's ever happened to. They just did one simple little move and then that was it and they couldn't move. That simple little move did not cause the herniated disc. That was just the end result of it deteriorating and breaking down and getting weaker. It's much, much, much easier to fix any problem when it's small. Can we all agree on that? Yes. Yeah. So the sooner somebody gets checked, the sooner we can prevent the damage, the younger that you are when you're getting adjusted, the healthier we can keep your back. Once it's been damaged and once the deterioration is there, once the discs are herniated, it's much harder to come back from, like any other health condition. It's so much easier to prevent type 2 diabetes by having a healthy diet than wait till you're full blown into type 2 diabetes and trying to reverse your body through that process. Does that make sense? Okay. So, is there hope? Yes. What do we do? Now we know what not to do. Number one, get adjusted. Get rid of the subluxation so it can't destroy and deteriorate and wear that disc out at a much faster pace. Exercise. The key thing that we become very weak in because we're sitting so much is our cores have gotten very, very weak and unstable. Meaning that the muscles around our core, which are abdominal and back muscles and pelvic muscles, the weaker that they get, the less support that we have around our backs and our spines. So can a weak core affect the neck? Yes, because when the core goes weak, our posture goes like this, the head goes forward, now the head's under pressure and stressed more than it should be. With a good strong core, our heads come back, they're being supported by our spine the way it's designed. So even the simplest exercises like planks we now are saying this is the best way to work out your core and exercise. We used to say you had to do all these sit-ups and crunches and leg lifts and do all this stuff, but if you actually look at the back while somebody is doing a sit-up or a crunch, they're actually doing more damage to their back over time. So even though that engages the stomach muscle, it, it puts the, the back in a very risky situation. So planks are by far the best way to do it. They're very simple to do. There's planking, as you can see here, like a push-up position. There's planks on your elbow, side planks. There's all kinds of modifications of things to do. But basically, you could even modify them to the point where you're on your elbows and your knees and just engaging. Heck, I wouldn't mind if you sat in your chair while you were at work or driving to work and just engaged your stomach muscle and held it and pulled your belly button in for a little while and did anything to engage your stomach muscle if you can't do a plank. But most of us don't do that. It keeps getting weaker and weaker and weaker, and then the back has no muscular su to support around it. When you have a weak back, we need stronger muscles to help compensate on some level. And that doesn't necessarily mean big muscles. That means muscles with tone that are, that are there to support you in each movement that you make. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I want to go over these couple of x-rays. This is a little bit near and dear to my heart, shall we say. 
Um, they're not the best pictures. I tried to throw this together, and my this next one, when I looked at it, I'm really disappointed with, but I'll explain what happened in a couple of seconds. So this is light, I know, um, but on this x-ray, we see disc spaces, and I marked this, these blue marks off. This is a patient of mine. Came in with a back problem, and when I told him that he had degenerative discs and spondylosis, which are the bone spurs and things like that, on these levels, I explained that not only did he need to get adjusted to feel better, but we needed to do exercises and do maintenance and do wellness and protect his spine over time. He did not do that. So he came in, got a few adjustments, felt better, stopped care because he felt better. The problem was still lingering inside. Symptoms are important for doctors to guide us, to help you, to know where your issue is coming from. But it doesn't mean that your problem has gone because you don't feel anything. 80% of us have disc problems and don't even know they're there. So much of our health care period is like that. You can have cancer with no symptom. You have heart disease with no symptoms. You can't wait till you have a heart attack to treat heart disease. We all understand that now, right? So don't wait. You go for tests. You get checked. Spine is the same thing. The difference is, is that people are literally dying because they're not taking care of this and don't have the knowledge about this because they're letting this go. And the secular of what happens is, let's see if it comes out. Nope, sorry, that's terrible. So, try to take a picture off of my computer so I can show it to you, but it didn't come out. Barely, you might be able to see that there are three titanium screws screwed into this gentleman's low back and a rod that goes down the back of it. Sorry that that picture came out so stinky. He ended up with surgery, came back to see me, said he's in agonizing pain after his surgery. The pain never really went away. But now I've got three levels that I can no longer do anything with in his back. Because of the screws. What's that? Because of the screws. They're all screwed together with titanium. I can't do an adjustment on that. That doesn't move anymore. What it did do is what most surgeons now are starting to understand. and. That's why a lot of times you'll hear things like, I know you have this problem, but let's try everything else first before we do the surgery from a lot of doctors that I have a lot of respect for that are surgeons that we refer patients to and communicate with. Let's wait. <laughs> let's find something else. Let's give your body a chance first, right? The level above where that surgery was done is under intense pressure because now that level has to compensate in all of its movements and has to take the pressure on of all those other joints that can no longer move. It deteriorates and breaks down very rapidly. Most, if you Google spinal surgery, it'll say things like 70 to 90% effective. That's a very old study that they use to market their techniques. 70 to 90% does not in any way, shape or form fit with other studies that are done by workers' compensation committees around the country that will say less than 20% in most states of people who have low back surgery ever get back to work again. That's exactly the flip-flop opposite, 70 and 90%. So what, that makes you go, well, what? Well, you have to go back and look at the details of that 70 to 90% study that they're saying is effective and say, how do they outline the criteria for 70 to 90% better? And you realize if you look at the tiny, fine little print, so to speak, it's the people who were the same or better after surgery. Meaning right after surgery, between 10 and 30% of the people are worse. Immediately after, about 70 to 90% see some level of improvement or haven't changed at all, and they consider that a success. So you have to look carefully, <laughs> okay? Statistically, what we're seeing is 70 to 80% of the people are having to go back and have another surgery within five to 10 years. Because the next level up or the next level down deteriorates and breaks down because of these fusions. And then what happens? Now you've got one, two, three, four, five levels of fusion. That's how they fixed it. They went back in and did it again. Mm -hmm. This person was no better. 
and agonizing pain. Felt good for about two months after surgery. Came in and said, Doc, is there anything you do? I'm in agony. I'm taking these pills all the time. I can't live like this. What can I do? There is no bone left to move in his low back. It's all completely covered in screws and titanium. This person committed suicide. Horrible story, but I want you to understand the effects of this. Agonizing pain. This was not a sad person. This is a very successful grandfather in his early 60s. Lots of money, big house, 20-something grandkids, very happy human being with a bad back. This is not an uncommon story. This happens a lot because you get to the point where you're in agonizing pain and there's nothing left to do and nothing anybody else can do to stop it. So we have new surgeries now where we can put nerve stimulators into your back and completely shut your nervous system off and nerve blocks and all these other kind of things to try and temporarily stop you from being able to feel anything to try and stop the pain. My point is, would you rather get adjusted? Yeah. Maybe do some exercises? Maybe try and prevent stuff like this from happening in the first place would be the best scenario, right? Yeah. And not wait till it's this bad. That's, that's my point tonight. And when I say that, I want you to understand it from a, from a standpoint of, I'm not just talking about your back. I'm talking about everything. When it comes to healthcare, there's no real fix. There's treatments of conditions. The only real fix we have is, can we sleep a little better? Can we stress a little less? Can we go for exercises and walks and do healthy, healthy exercise for ourselves? Can we get adjusted? Can we do things that are going to make our bodies healthier now? Or do we wait until the crisis hits and try and work our way back? Unfortunately, I say in a lot of my classes, and you may have heard me say it before, Everybody wants to eat a salad after they have a heart attack. Nobody wants to eat a salad before. We have a thinking problem in our culture when it comes to health care. It's the biggest problem we have. That's our health care crisis. Is I'm going to eat whatever I want, drink whatever I want, do whatever I want, and then woe is me when it all goes to hell in a handbasket. You have the power to make a change and make a difference. It's not that hard to eat just a little bit better. It's not that hard to do a very easy walk at the end of your day. Probably great for your brain to calm down all the stress you put up with working with work coworkers and whatever else you have to put up with or even the traffic on the way home. And it cracks me up because people say, well, you know, I've got to take my dog out for a walk. My dog needs it. Been laying around in the house all day. So well, you need it. <laughs> Forget the dog. You need to go for the walk more than the dog does. You've been sitting at a desk all day. You moved a lot less than the dog did. That dog's been probably running around your house while you were gone. <laughs> Who knows what they got into while you were out? <laughs> we've got to move. We've, we've got a big problem. We've got to get moving. And that's my bottom line point. And what I love to close my classes with is my favorite quote of all, is when you have your health, you have a thousand dreams. And when you lose your health, you only have one. And that's to get your health back. Our health should be our A, number one, top priority in everything we do. Because without it, everything we worry about, everything we think is important, doesn't matter one lick when you lose your health. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay? Yes. So, thank you for coming. A little bit of exercises, a little bit of planks, a little bit of walking, get adjusted. Mm -hmm. yes? yes? Yes. Awesome. Beautiful. You're all free to go and have a beautiful mm -hmm. evening. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you for watching our video. If you like what you saw, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Yeah, and like us on Facebook, 
There's always a lot of information also on our website at rosemontchiropractic.com.